Hello, we're starting. Um, hi. So my name is Luca Bruno. Um, I used to work at CoreOS. Now I'm working at Red Hat. Um, what we're going to talk about is the data CoreOS, um, which is kind of like putting all our idea, all our minds, all our kind of like developments, projects, and whatever, and kind of like visions. I'm not like I'm not pitching you anything, but it's like visions um, into like a Fedora-based operating system, uh, which basically means like taking ideas from existing worlds, existing projects and whatever, and trying to get like the best out of that. You're spoiling the presentation. No, <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and this is Jonathan, please. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan. Um, I still work at uh, Red Hat on uh, Fedora and Red Hat CoreOS. Um, yeah, let's dig in, we got a lot of stuff to cover. So I guess if you have zero context on what uh, Fedora CoreOS is, a simple definition is it's a minimal, opinionated, container-focused, automatically updating operating system designed for the cluster, but great as a standalone node as well. So there's a lot of things going on in that sentence there. So hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll sort of be able to make sense of what each of those parts mean. Uh, so your first reaction might be, wait a minute, this sounds a lot like some other distributions that I've heard in the past. And you'd be right, actually. There's were at least at least two distributions. Uh, so there was uh, Atomic Host and Container Linux. And of course, when I say Atomic Host, I mean Throw Atomic Host, Red Rel Atomic Host, CentOS Atomic Host. And um, they both sort of had the same goals, but there's still quite a lot of differences in how they go about fulfilling those goals. Um, and really, as Luca said at the beginning, which is why I was saying he was spoiling, is Fedora Core OS is really about taking the best of both worlds and sort of coming up with something that's sort of top in class. And uh, I guess some more context on this, if really you, you've been living under a rock. But about a year ago, almost to the day, um, Red Hat uh, acquired Core OS. And that's, that's, that really changed the future for those two OSs, right? And that's what's giving us this opportunity one year later to sort of tell you how we're combining these, um, the ideas from these two operating systems. Okay, so what is Fedora Core OS? So maybe we can start with what's on the host itself. So it really only has the minimum to boot the system, run containers, and update the system, right? So it just has, like its goal in life is to run containers. Um, there's no developer tools, it's not meant to be like, to hack on it actively. Uh, we're hoping to not have any uh, cloud agents in it, maybe cloud agents in the container, but not directly on the host. Um, hopefully no Python at all, uh, that might not work out, but we're trying our best. Um, so one consequence of that is no atomic command. Obviously atomic uh, was using uh, Python. Uh, I think that's, that's a really telling um, point, the fact that there's no atomic command, because you know, on Fedora Atomic Host and uh, Rel Atomic Host, the atomic command was sort of the entry point to the OS, and that's how you would manage your nodes. You would do like atomic host upgrade. And the idea here is you're not going to do that anymore because the host will manage itself. So you shouldn't have much reason to even log into the system, right? Because we take that load off of you. I'll, I'll talk about that a little more uh, later. Uh, so Fedora Core OS is the upstream of Red Hat Core OS. So for those of you who are in the room, in this room, for the previous talk, um, so we're trying to sort of set up the patterns that get inherited by Red Hat Core OS. So there's a lot of things that are similar. Uh, you know, the way that the OS is built is is very similar. Same tooling, a lot of the same technologies um, like Ignition. Um, and uh, just in general, similar design decisions. Um, but the major, major difference is, whereas Red Hat Core OS is sole purpose in life is to be uh, a platform for OpenShift, Fedora Core OS has sort of a wider view on what it's meant for. So you could run it as a standalone thing without OpenShift or Kubernetes, or you could also use it for OpenShift or for Kubernetes. We're still discussing what's going on there. Uh, actually, one of our secondary use case for Fedora Core OS is to run uh, to be a platform for other uh, container orchestrators. So it doesn't even have to be 
uh, OpenShift or <coughs> Kubernetes. Uh, so, okay, platform. So where is this thing going to run? So all the you know typical uh, popular clouds, AWS, Azure, OpenStack, etc., cetera, uh, VMware, VirtualBox, QEMU, and of course, bare metal. I don't think there's any surprises there. This is mostly um, uh, what Container Linux supports today. Architecture, so we're gonna start with uh, x86-64, and then uh, we're hoping to add uh, R64 and PPC 64 LE. And provisioning here. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so far, it was kind of like standard <coughs> distribution, standard things. Um, this part specifically, these few slides, are things that we are bringing over that we are carrying from Container Linux. We were doing a bunch of, th of things in Container Linux. A few of them we are kind of like happy with what we were doing and we want to bring it on into Fedora Core OS and some other not, but I'm not going to touch into those. Um, so the first one that is interesting that we are carrying over is Ignition. Um, I don't want to spoil my own talks that later we're going to all the details of this, um, but the idea is we need something which is like cloud in it, um, but we don't actually need cloud in it. We need something which is a smaller subset of cloud in it. Um, so we have this component called Ignition, which configures uh, a node when it is booting up in the cloud or on bare metal uh, by running some provisioning logic in the init ramifest. Um, and it is strictly a subset of cloud init because it only runs on first boot. It only takes care of what we call the first boot provisioning and not like the full life cycle of configuration management on this node. Um, it has like some cool properties by being able to trim it down on this subset we can actually enhance what we provide to a user uh, to something like atomic provisioning. Either the provisioning succeeds, so the node, the node boots, or it fails. And that's something that is like, it makes sense for first boot provisioning, but not for like a configuration manager. Um, and the last point of this is, um, it is a machine interface. So the input to this subsystem is JSON. Um, I've been through operation, you have been through operation, you know that like writing manually JSON is terrible. Um, doesn't have comment, it has a lot of like gotchas, uh, and that's not what you want to do. If you are writing something manually, you want like a user-friendly interface. And that user-friendly interface is YAML. Um, now you see there is like a, a gap between the two, the user writing YAML and the machine taking JSON. And that's where we actually build tools. So we, we have additional tooling uh, which converts between these two words, like an higher level user interface and a lower level machine interface. Um, so Ignition only takes care of the JSON part. Um, the actual like user flow, the user interface would be something like this. Um, on one side, you are providing us something that you can humanly manage, so a YAML file. In the middle, this arrow is kind of like collapsing a lot of logic, a lot of stuff. Um, there is some process in the middle, and at the end of the day, you get out this ignition configuration, the JSON file, which is like much more, much more easier to handle, to process on the machine side. And this is what is actually used um, on the provisioning side. So there is a lot of confusion. I'm saying this because like, people are often confused between YAML, JSON, ignition, cloud init, whatever. Uh, Ignition is only concerned with the JSON, but you as a user, you are touching a lot of other things and most likely like an IR interface. Um, then the next one that we are also like um, carrying from, from Container Linux is the way how you would install, the way how you would deploy um, this operating system. Um, in the normal world, in a traditional infrastructure, you have some kind of like installation step, which you start from an ISO or from, some, sorry, from some kind of image and you, with that image, which is not the final OS, you install something onto the disk, you customize it, and that's your installed OS. So you, there are a few steps in the middle, a few artifacts, and there is a bit of like mixed logic and data in the middle. Um, this is in Fedora world, in Red Hat world, uh, something that I'm still learning. It's like this Anaconda kickstart and a few of other like RPM base and user configuration steps. Um, in Container Linux, and what we want to do for Fedora Corus as well, it's um, being much closer to the way that cloud provisioning works. In the cloud, you have an image, which is your virtual machine image, 
which is like <coughs> kind of like a golden image and it's already the operating system itself. And when it is booted for the first time, you provision it in the specific way that you want this node to operate. Uh, but the base image is the same everywhere. Uh, in order to do that, we are trying to um, kind of like drift a bit apart from Anaconda Kickstart and try to use instead like what we already have, so Ignition and disk images. Um, so what we're gonna provide for Fedora CoreOS are like disk images that you directly like DD, or if, if you're in a cloud, you already have them like as image, like AMI or whatever is, is it called in your um, cloud environment. Um, and those images are actually um, provisioned in this way via Ignition at the first boot. So whether you are on bare metal or on whatever cloud provider, the booting step for a new node is always the same. You get some image and you provision it on first boot. Um, that is kind of like easy in a cloud environment because you have like cloud API to manage the, these kind of images. Um, if you are like on bare metal, it's usually a bit harder. Uh, and there are two strategies that we are gonna provide both of them because they are covering different use cases. Um, so at the end of the day, there's gonna be like artifacts like ESO, bootable ESO that you can boot as like a live OS and you can kickstart, but not via yeah, a real kickstart, um, the installation process. And at the same time, we're gonna provide like artifacts so that if you are directly pixie booting your node, so directly into the OS without in, any installation step in the middle, um, you can still do that. Um, there is like a huge eventually here because um, all the things that you were mentioning here, like we know exactly what we want to do. Um, we are kind of like merging technologies and projects, so it's like a few of these already exist, a few other are kind of like um, no problem, we just need to do it, and some other things that we are gonna to touch at the end are kind of like, we know that we have a problem, we, we are actually discussing the, the, the solution. Um, which brings us to the next step, which is like, if we provide you an image instead of like an installer, um, it means that we already mandate some kind of like partitioning for you. Um, that's both true and false. Um, it is true because we have to pick some kind of defaults, um, <coughs> In particular, in this case, like we are picking for you how the partition in the layout looks like, so how many partitions you have in the system, how they are allocated, and we are also picking for you like what is the default file system, um, which is something which is again like mm, not not very controversial and a bit of a merge between the two world. Um, so we are splitting like the main root file system, so slash, and the place where you would like store your data, so slash var into two different partitions, and we are defaulting to XFS, which is like modern and uh, good for containerized workload. Um, at the same time, um, this is our default. You may want to have like a different like customized partitioning or uh, volume formatting approach. Uh, and in that case, like back to the original discussion, everything is done on first boot, customized via Ignition, so Ignition knows uh, how to repartition a disk and how to format it, even if it is like um, the root file system or the bar file system. Um, problem is, um, Ignition was coming from a different world, so from container Linux approach. Um, we are still like trying to <laughs> Uh, make it a bit more like generic upstream project and not like something very coupled to, um, to, to container Linux. So uh, this feature, uh, some of them doesn't work right now, uh, but the idea is we already know what we want. Uh, we already have this configuration, the, the way to, the knobs to configure this, and we need to kind of like plug it all together into the pipeline. Um, uh, a couple more slides. Um, another thing which is way more controversial is like container runtimes. <coughs> um, container runtimes, I could speak like for hours about them. Uh, at some point, like everybody is his own preferred one. Um, if you're a developer, you actually want to write you one because it's like it's cool, nice, you learn a lot of stuff, uh, and then you try to convince other people to actually ship it in, in their own distribution. Um, so if you are on the distribution side instead, Instead, what you're trying to do is say no to people um, and try to keep it like to a same, to a same amount, to a same set. Um, so the set that we're gonna ship is Cryo, because to be honest, like nowadays, most of the containerized workload are on top of Kubernetes, and Kubernetes has this interface to the container runtimes, which is called the CRI, and Cryo is basically like the component that you want to have there. Um, at the same time, there are some workloads and some use cases that are either not on Kubernetes, or they have like um, partially different semantics, like 
I want to run the Kubernetes components themselves in some container runtime, but without configuring the whole Kubernetes environment, how do I do it? There are specific runtimes for that, and Podman, <laughs> from my point of view, fits into that category, um, so they are kind of like complementing each other. Um, the last one, the last item is, is this set, is Mobi, what used to be called Docker. Um, and again, like, fact is, reality is, there are a lot of people that are coming to the container um, world because they know Docker. Um, at some point in the future, maybe they will know also about like, how to handle your whole infrastructure, your whole cluster orchestration with Kubernetes, but probably they are not yet there, or they, are, they have some use cases where it doesn't fit. Um, so we are also going to ship Mobi uh, for those use cases. Um, in a slightly different way than what it used to be on Fedora and, and Rel. Uh, I'm not very familiar with this technology, again, coming from another, from another world. Uh, but the idea is, Mobi is there, if you need it, it's gonna be socket activated, so usual systemd local socket activation. Um, it's not gonna do a lot of like magic, it's not gonna like pre-prepare stuff, it's not gonna have like defaults for reformatting, repartitioning, or, or whatever, so not this. Not, not to this Docker storage setup that I've heard, like, a lot of people love it. Um, and that's it. It's like basically a plain as possible container runtime so that you can customize your infrastructure as you want. Um, and this is like the last part that we are kind of like carrying over from container Linux, which is uh, networking and firewalling. Um, and the idea here as well is we try, as a distribution developer, as a distribution, we try to get out of your way as much as possible. Um, and we push for a world where we only provide you, we only take care of the first boot provision. So whatever you need to bootstrap this node to bring it up to the initial configuration. And then after that, uh, any kind of like configuration change, which means also like network configuration change or firewall configuration change, is done via some other specific component, possibly a containerized one. Um, this means, for example, for a firewall, um, yes, we support firewall. We have IP tables or NF table. There is still this, like, this split in the, in the Linux world. Um, we support those, but the idea is we support a static configuration that you set up on the first boot and you never change. If you need to change something after that, then you need to have like, a containerized component that actually owns these mutable data, these mutable rules for the lifetime of the node. Um, same, idea, same idea, same things for the network part. Um, here it is a bit more controversial, let's say, because um, even in, like, in the Fedora and RHEL world itself, there are like two main projects. Like, um, there is Network Manager, which is pretty much everywhere, um, and, there is net, and there is Network D, which is not it's like as pervasive as Network Manager, but it actually fits pretty well into what I'm describing here. Um, and so the idea is, Given that we are pushing for something new, given that it's a good time to kind of like have a um, plain discussion about where we want to go. Um, Network D is there, yes, it was working pretty well in container Linux. At the same time, like Network Manager could use a bit of like push and like giving them a direction for what we would like to have. Um, so we are actively working with the Network Manager and developers in order to kind of like get feature parity or at least um, getting in the same direction so that we can use it the same way as we were using Network D in Container Linux. Um, and that's pretty much it, I would say, for, for yeah. my part. So, yeah. Please. Uh, so next big item, of course, the update system. So just to clear one thing right now, we're still using RPMs. We're not using Gen 2. Uh, mm, is this new? Uh, no, that's OK. That's OK? Sorry. It turned it off. Uh, I beat the battery. Sorry, you guys. Do you want mine? Yeah, I, I can use uh, Lucas. I don't know why it keeps turning on. Something like the setting. No, the battery's okay. 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 <coughs> um, yeah, so we're not going to use Gen 2 RPMs from uh, Fedora. And uh, of course, we'll still be using. Uh, RPM OS3 from uh, just like in uh, Atomic Host. Uh, so this is a departure from Container Linux, of course, <coughs> which was using um, Update Engine, which is from uh, Chrome OS. Uh, so RPM OS3, you know, it's, it's very, I'm one of the maintainers for RPM OS3. It's, it's well maintained and uh, we can easily modify it as we need for, uh, for Fedora for OS. Uh, the big item here, of course, is uh, fully automated updates. 
So this is really the most important difference between you know Fedora Atomic Host and Fedora Core OS. And it's really what's set apart even before between Container Linux and Fedora Atomic Host is the automatic updates. Because when you have automatic updates, you don't have to care about your node, right? So it, the relationship that you have be between you and the OS is completely different. What we were doing with Atomic Host is we were sort of telling people, okay, uh, we send out these updates every two weeks, but you have to log in and do RPM Mystery Upgrade. Of course, you can script that, but it wasn't sort of, it wasn't part of the model to have automated updates. Whereas with Container Linux, um, you know, it's like from right away from day one, it was automatic updates right away, even for single nodes. And um, this has huge ramifications because, for example, if you have automatic updates, you sort of cannot break the OS. You cannot break backwards for compatibility ever, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a tall order. Um, of course, with automatic updates, you sort of also have to have automatic rollbacks, which is something we never quite got to in uh, Atomic Host. Uh, Container Linux, if I understand, had an automatic rollback, but it didn't have all the niceties. For example, uh, user-defined health checks uh, wasn't there, and that's something we're looking to add. So, for example, you can say, you know, um, reboot into the new update, but if I can't reach this server, or if I can't uh, see this device, then something is wrong, and I need you to roll back. And uh, so we'll sort of have that functionality uh, for uh, the cluster case, we also want to make sure that, and again, this is also something from Container Linux, we want to make sure that the nodes are uh, cluster aware, meaning that when you do an upgrade, you're not taking down all the nodes at the same time, but you have, sort of have a controlled rollout throughout your cluster so you don't have any downtime. Um, on the release engineering side, another really cool uh, thing in uh, Container Linux that we want to adopt also for Fedora Core OS is uh, this concept of controlled or rate limited rollouts. So what that means is that when we have a new update stage and ready to go, instead of making it available to everyone at the same time, we can sort of let it trickle down, trickle out uh, little by little and give time to see if, you know, either we notice there's, there's a higher failure rate than usual in the nodes that are uh, updating or give time to users to report, okay, this update is completely broken and we can stop the update and sort of look at what's, uh, what's going on there. It keeps turning off. It keeps turning off? We can just, Do you yeah. hear me okay in the back? Any uh, no, it's, it's for the recording. It's not going to, to the mics, it's, it's for the recording. But oh, it's for the recording. It's for the recording for some, for, for some reason. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, it's just a no? no? cover saving feature no or it's a bug, I don't know. Can you just check if it is not muted? Yes, we're just playing with it. Sorry. <laughs> Test one two. Oh, good. <coughs> uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I think I covered everything there. Uh, okay, so streams. So now we're going outside of the OS and really talking about the environment in which this OS will run, right? So with Fedora Core OS, uh, we want to have something similar to the uh, Container Linux model. And we sort of had that for Atomic Host, but uh, so we were gonna have uh, three produ production OS3 refs. So refs are like branches, right? With the OS3 being Git for your OS model. So it's a different Git branch. So uh, you have the uh, testing ref, which is basically uh, whatever is in the Fedora repo plus what is in updates, in the updates repo. And then uh, we let that bake for two weeks, and if it goes well, we promote it to stable. And then uh, we also have the next ref, and next is basically if uh, Rawhide hasn't branched yet, so for example right now, right, we're in Fedora 29, and there's no Fedora 30 that has been branched yet. So testing would just, uh, next would just be tracking testing. Uh, once Fedora 30 branches, it would be tracking Fedora 30. So the idea is with next is either the next release of Fedora or the same thing as uh, the testing ref. And we're sort of gonna have to, we, we will be recommending people to run, you know, most of their nodes on stable, but then some nodes on testing and some nodes on next, just so they can, <laughs> we can get a heads up on if something is gonna break their system, 
we can catch it before it goes all the way to stable. Uh, so as usual with Container Linux and Atomic Host, actually we're looking at you know two week releases. This is not contractual. We might change it, but uh, two week releases plus uh, out of cycle patches for security updates or if there's a really terrible bug fix that needs to, to get in. Uh, of course, we'll have a bunch of development reps that are not necessarily meant for uh, for consumers, but just for, more for, for ourselves or for other Fedora Core OS developers. So one for tracking Rawhide. Uh, Bodhi updates will basically be a <coughs> nightly snapshot of testing. And uh, Bodhi update testing is testing plus the update testing repo. Uh, probably, I should, I should put this point higher up, but a really important point here is that the refs are unversioned, right? So when you look at Fedora Atomic Host and Rel Atomic Host, um, actually not Rel Atomic Host, but in Fedora Atomic Host, uh, the refs were, had the version of the operating system in them, right? So for Fedora 29, you have Fedora slash 29 slash x86-64, blah, blah, blah. But what that means is that when we get to Fedora 30, you have to do a rebase from Fedora 29 to Fedora 30. Right, so it breaks that illusion, or I guess we never really tried to have it be an illusion of, of a single stream. Whereas with Fedora Core OS, these refs are unversioned, meaning that stable is going to be tracking Fedora, let's say right now it's tracking Fedora 29. And then at some point, well, after Fedora 30 releases, it'll jump from 29 to 30, right? In that same single uh, stream of updates. So that has a, a huge sort of it's, it's a big difference conceptually in the model of how we approach updates, right? Because before rebasing from one major version to the next was sort of an explicit step that you would take. Whereas now this is something that we have to make sure nothing is gonna break and really, really test it. Um, I think I covered everything here. Uh, so schedule, we're targeting uh, Fedora 30 for the initial release. Um, we still have a lot, a lot of items left to do. Um, there's some things that are likely not going to make it into the initial release. For example, uh, multi-arch. We'll probably start with, of course, x86.4. <coughs> We're trying right now, as to speak, to build it on uh, PPC64 LE at least. Um, and then uh, for automatic updates, for example, that's something that we really want to have from the get-go because that's sort of part of the uh, value add of, of uh, Fedora Core OS. So I'll just show you. So what? Okay. Thirty minutes. I'll just show you a couple of links here. So we got uh, probably the three most important repos right now is the Fedora Core OS config. Am I connected to your Wi-Fi? Yes, I am. <coughs> The cable? Uh, I mean, internet cable. If you need internet. Oh no no, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so FerroCores config is where we're hosting the actual definition from for the OS right now. So, for example, if you go in um, uh, FerroCore OS base. Right, so this is, if you're familiar with, oh, higher font, sorry. <coughs> so if you're familiar with um, uh, Atomic Host, you know, this is the exact same thing that you would feed to RPM which we compose. Uh, the only difference is in YAML instead of JSON, which is really nice. Um, you know, so we got our repos here, but the interesting bit I want to show you is at the bottom here. So this is where we're actually defining all the packages that we're uh, shipping in uh, Fedora Core OS. So for example, like Luca was talking, we have NF tables here. Um, and uh, this is likely to change. Uh, I'll show you a demo of uh, Fedora Core OS, but another repo probably worth showing is, um, so another massive difference between uh, Atomic Host and Fedora Core OS and Red Hat Core OS is the way that the OS is built. So there's a whole other talk about this after, so I won't go too much into details. I think the talk is right after mine actually, but uh, we have this tool called Core OS Assembler. And Core OS Assembler makes it 
super easy for you to build your own Fedora Core OS locally and test it. So this this really we're hoping this will you know make make it much easier for you to contribute to the project and see exactly what effect it's having. So um, you know you can use it's just a bunch of scripts. I mean it's it's in Bash right now, uh, but it's working out pretty well so far. But uh, the idea is that repo I just showed you, the Fedora Core S config, you literally just feed it uh, to Core S Assembler. You do Core S Assembler in it, and then the repo. And then you just do a fetch, and then you, it, it, fetch will basically uh, pull all those RPMs that I showed you in that list. And you do a Core S Assembler build, and it'll build the OS repo for you, and then it'll build uh, uh, QCAL images for you. And then you can do, Core assembler run, and it'll even run it, run that latest artifact you just built in QEMU, and you can test it out. So, we took that core S assembler, we put it in a Jenkins pipeline. So this is the current um, repo holding the definition files for Fedora Core OS. Um, so I won't go through the Jenkins files too much, but it's basically uh, doing the exact same thing I just showed you, right? With container assembler in it, fetch, and then building it. And then we have the output going, so this is running in CentOS CI in the OpenShift instance. And then uh, we have the artifacts. So we have the artifacts here. Okay. So we have the artifacts here, and uh, so you can test it out. I mean, this is still really early stuff. We're still defining a lot of critical parts of the OS, but uh, if you want to give it a spin, you can, and I, actually I can, do that right now. Uh, Zoom a bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, just one second. There we go. Okay. So here I have uh, QCAL2 that I just, um, that's from that pipeline I just showed you. Uh, so this is the CT config that uh, Luca was talking about. This is a YAML file that sort of replaces cloud in it. Uh, so there you can write, you know, the SSH keys you wanna uh, give access to and the groups, etc. And you can feed that to uh, <coughs> CT. Uh, CT is what will convert it to JSON basically, but it, it doesn't just convert from YAML to JSON, it does a bunch of other things. And now we get our ignition config. Uh, right, and then uh, we can feed that to uh, Fedora Core OS. So you can use QEMU directly, but I use uh, vert install. The really key part here is uh, that dash dash QEMU command line. This is basically like an escape hash for libvert for whatever command you want to pass to QEMU directly that libvert doesn't understand or doesn't wrap. And then here I'm passing it the, the JSON file that we just created. Okay. So now we've got Fedora Core OS up and running. Okay, and now, oh, I should have showed you the, yeah. So as it says, all aspects subject to change, highly experimental. Uh, one thing I want to show you is, well, two things, I guess. Uh, <coughs> Docker, no Docker, but there is Moby Engine. <laughs> that was a trick. Um, in uh, OS release, so, you know, we, we identify ourselves as Fedora, so ID is Fedora. But if you look at the if you look at the variant ID at the bottom, we're Core OS, and you know in Container Linux the ID was Container Linux, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Core so uh, we didn't want to uh, make or no, it was Core, Core OS. OS. Yeah. So we didn't want to make it Core OS here to to really def we're closer to Fedora than we are to uh, Gen two, obviously. Um, I guess that's it. I I think we're ready to take questions. Let me just. Quickly go back to the yeah. So I'll just go through this quickly. A lot of things are still being discussed. You know, uh, Core S or OKD. Uh, it's a hot topic. It's basically going to depend on what's easier to maintain in Fedora. 
uh, collecting metrics. You know, in Container Linux, this was tied to the update system. For Fedora Core OS, we're trying to see if we can sort of decouple that from the update system. Uh, host extensions, huge topic. Uh, you know, whether we should uh, recommend package layering for some options and how to handle out of tree kernel modules. Containerized services like Torx on uh, Container Linux or system containers on Atomic, those are things that we're trying to move away from. <coughs> Um, there's a lot more discussions going on at the Fedora Chorus Tracker repo. Okay, and uh, you can get involved at uh, Fedora Core OS, uh, Freenode channel, the Chorus mailing list. Uh, we have we weekly community meetings on uh, Freenode. Uh, you can join the discussions on the GitHub Tracker repo, of course. Uh, a lot of things to do, so if it's a great opportunity if you want to get involved in open source. All right, are there any questions? Wonder. Uh, you mentioned that multi well, support is still a work in progress. Can you give an example of some of the things that something would be important for the architects? I'm not sure what would be architecture specific for the uh, um, Can you repeat the question? For uh, the, the question record. was what are some of the challenges that we're hitting with multi arch right now? Uh, so the way we're building the OS is with this container assembler thing, and we're actually using container assembler as a container. And a lot of the things that go in that container uh, are not, uh, aren't currently being built for uh, multi-arch. And um, I think Cine, you were doing a lot, of, a lot of work on that with PPC. And you know, we've just have a lot of assumptions in our code base that were, like as we were sort of bootstrapping and getting started, we were sort of just testing this on x86. And I was sort of going back and backtracking and going, okay, we got to generalize this and generalize that. And um, I don't have anything specific for you right now, but you can definitely go on the core S assembly repo and there's like at least two separate issues about, about that. Sini, do you want Next one, one for you guys, one here. What's going to be the, the artifact that you ship? I mean, you, you talked a little bit ago about how the container runtime is available. Are you going to ship a gold image that has all of them available that somebody can choose from, or is the expectation that you can just ship the assembler and people spin their own? No, yeah, the goal is we ship one image. Okay, there's a little nuance there, but we're, we're shipping one image that's going to be used everywhere, right? That's why we don't have to have any cloud agents. Uh, we're shipping with all the, the container runtimes that you, you would want. Um, there's a little trick there in the sense that the way Ignition works, it needs to know what platform you're running on. So it'll act, because for Ignition to know where to get its metadata from, it needs to know what platform it's running on. So right now we're shipping slightly sep uh, different uh, variations of the same golden image. But um, yeah, to answer your question, it's basically the same image everywhere. We're, we're only going to have uh, like QCAL2s, and then depending on the platform, we'll have variations of that. But the disk image itself will be the same. So the expectation for the end user is that your ignition will have to ensure that you turn off whatever agents you don't want to use. It, it'll know, because the ignition, the platform knows what platform it, Feroc OS knows what platform it's running on, so it knows how to, uh, like for example, on Azure, right? You have to do this check-in process to tell Azure, "Oh, I'm a healthy node. Don't kill me." Uh, so uh, we have we have code in Fedora Core OS that can see, okay, we're running Azure. Tell the hypervisor or whatever that, or the metadata server that we're okay. We we booted successfully. The the short answer is each image for each specific platform has its own platform ID that you can introspect at runtime, so that you can conditionalize execution of something based on that. So the, the service itself can detect whether it's running, where it should be enabled or not, and run or not. Um, do we have still time? Yeah. Uh, what about this dilemma of Kubernetes or OKD? What about it? <laughs> Uh, so the question, repeat the question yeah, the point. question was, what about this dilemma, uh, OKD or Kubernetes? Uh, the issue right now is that neither Kubernetes or OKD are very uh, actively maintained in Fedora, and of course, we're a Fedora distribution. We got it derived from Fedora, so it's mostly a question of um, 
can we get maintainers for these packages and uh, you know actually start uh, if if we if we can get in, get maintainers and get people to uh, or have the maintainers receptive to bug reports from uh, users of the core OS, then it'll make it much more appealing to to ship. There was one here in the front. Okay, two questions. One, is there some uh, container mar marketplace plans for? Um, this is, I would say that this is completely out of scope for this. So we are, as in container Linux, it was like a base OS for your infrastructure. And then you can run whatever you want on top of that as long as it is a container. It's pretty much the same scope. So we don't provide a container marketplace. It could be part of Fedora, whatever other project, but it's not. Yeah, that's it. I will mention we're, we're working on this other, this one container called Fedora Toolbox. I mean, it's not a marketplace. It doesn't answer your question in any way, but uh, we have, we have a, it's just related because we do have some containers that are like sort of made to run on Fedora Core OS. Like we're actively making sure that it works well with the core Fedora Core OS workflow. So Toolbox is one of those examples to allow you to sort of easily debug uh, on the platform. Okay, and do you plan to put KVM? Oh, of course, yeah. You mean QEMU? QEMU and KVM. <coughs> It's not the main goal. Um, I wouldn't say we don't, but I wouldn't even say it's the primary goal of that. So yeah. It's kind of like, it depends, as usual. <laughs> I think right now it's not. What was the question? Um, so the question, you have to repeat it because you're there. Yeah. Like. The question was, do we plan to put uh, like Q and U or Libbird on the system? Yeah. So I noticed you're running Q and U directly and also Yes, yeah, yeah, good point, yeah. No, review with the version, because you, I noticed you're, you're not specifying the CPU, model, CPU type or the machine model, things like that. And I know gotcha. you can do, um, have better defaults. So I actually have this script that does, uh, that I use to create VMs really quickly, but I didn't want to use my scripts for this demo to not obfuscate what was happening. So and I was so just... review it with the bird, people in the Yeah, gotcha, okay. okay. Hmm? Well, I, these days OpenShift is packaged more as containers as opposed to anything else to install. So, are, what what are the issues with having a Fedora? Like, do you really need a Fedora RPM of OpenShift or OpenID to install this stuff, or is it able to just use the containers so, that upstream or okay, the mic. OKD produce? Um. So I can take this because I, I felt the pain already. Um, so before traditionally in container Linux. Oh, and just repeat the question. I'm sorry, the question was like, what's, what, do we actually have to ship RPMs for OpenShift or KD, whatever, given if most of the stuff it's like containers? Um, the answer is, uh, before in container Linux, we were not shipping any of these, like any Kubernetes um, co um, components at all. We were using like a quasi containerized kubelet, um, which is kind of like, not how it's meant to be run, um, and it was giving us problems. So we are kind of like exploring a new path here where we are building an OS and we didn't have the kubelet before, so we have to put the kubelet now into the OS, and it must be coming from some Fedora RPM. So that's the, that's the short answer. Everything else, like the control plane of Kubernetes or any other operator, uh, extension or whatever, yes, it will be run as a container. But there must be something on the host itself, and that, some, that, some, that something is the kubelet, and the kubelet right now should be in the host. If somebody fixes it upstream, like kubelet containerized, but I don't think it's happening right now. That's it. <coughs> So, so the follow-up comment was that um, even the artifact produced by OpenShift upstream, they are mostly like focused on some specific platform and use case and doesn't cover the whole Fedora ecosystem architecture and, and what else, right? But if you have just one branch, 
this could be hard to like know uh, your configuration file won't work or something like that. How you want to handle it? Yeah, that's that's actually one. Of, oh, sorry. The comment was if we're making a single stream. Uh, where you seamlessly go from Fedora 29 to Fedora 30, how are you going to deal with backwards incompatibilities? And the, the answer is we're going to try our best to sort of catch that before it happens and, and work with the maintainers to not break compatibility. Um, yeah, that's, that's going to be a challenge, you're right, because again, with Fedora Atomic Host, you're the one rebasing, so it's sort of your fault if you break the system, whereas automatic updates is our fault if we break the system. follow up on that, but I mean, Fedora tries to track upstream communities pretty closely, so would it not be fairly hard? You can work with the Fedora maintainer to maybe try to do backwards compatibility, but it's their responsibility then to try to push that change upstream, which may or may not happen. Yeah, it, it, I mean, I'm just saying that it depends on where the incompatibility is coming from. If it's something with the way the package is packaged, then yeah, we're looking there, but if it's something with upstream itself, I mean, we'll just have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, small follow-ups. Um, we have been doing container Linux releases for like four years, probably a bit more, um, with like auto-updating to the latest kernel, systemd, docker, whatever. Um, so we know that it's a pain. We also know that it's also what we want to do. Um, and the goal is kind of like working with the whole ecosystem so that whenever you have to introduce some breaking change, there is some way for us to auto-update into, into the new version. And in general, to try to convince you not to do that unless you have a case for it. Um, so it's kind of like, it's a global ecosystem problem and we should all work together. But we have been doing that in the past. Uh, it works pretty well, but it was like a smaller world now. It's like, it's a bigger challenge. That's it, that's it. Awesome. Thank you very Thank much you for very